welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. The Library of Congress is the oldest federal cultural institution in the United States. Established in 1800, it began life as a small congressional library. But over the ensuing 218 years, it has become the National Library of the United States. The Library of Congress is the largest library in the world, with collections of more than 100 million items and a staff of over 5,000. Overseeing all of this, the Librarian of Congress, and that's a big job. Dr. Carla Hayden is the first woman and the first African American to hold the position, and she's the first professional librarian to lead the Library of Congress in over 60 years. After working in libraries in Chicago and Baltimore, she was appointed the 14th Librarian of Congress by President Barack Obama in 2016. She was also president of the American Library Association from 2003 to 2004. Dr. Hayden paid a visit to West Virginia and the WVLC earlier this year, and I had a chance to sit down and talk to her about her life, the Library of Congress, and what the future holds for public libraries in the United States. First female librarian of Congress, first African-American librarian of Congress, first professional librarian in the position in over 60 years. That's a lot of firsts. That's a lot of firsts, but I have to tell you, being here in West Virginia with the library community that supported my nomination uh, is really inspiring because all of these firsts, there are so many people that were there before me as well in different positions. So it's all, it's everybody's first. Let's talk about uh, your childhood. You grew up in New York and Chicago and somehow ended up as a librarian. How did all that work? Well, what was interesting is I was born on the campus of Florida A&M. My dad was teaching music there. And then we moved to New York when he became very interested in jazz. And he oh. played with Cannonball Adderley and knew people like Miles Davis. But our family home is in Illinois. <laughs> and so I've been around a few places, but the thing that I have to tell you, in each place, I was introduced to a library or had a, a library story. Was there one particular book growing up that affected you? Oh, yes. And one of the librarians here today brought a copy of it, Bright April. Mm -hmm. And it was about a little girl who's a brownie, and she was about eight years old, and at the time I got the book, I was eight years old, and she was a little brown girl, actually mm -hmm. the same color, and it was the first time I saw myself in a book. I loved reading anyway, but to see myself, I thought, in a book just sealed the deal. It's amazing what a book can do for It can do so much, and since I've been talking about that book, I've received letters from women who are about the same age, but from different parts of the country and different backgrounds and cultures. And they all said they identified with that book as well because they were either outsiders or they had some type of feeling of being different. And they all related to that book. So tell me about your journey to the Library of Congress. How did all of that work out? I was very fortunate to have spent quite a bit of my career in Baltimore, Maryland, and it was a city library, but also a state library in the very tight library community. And I got a chance to put into action the things that I was teaching when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, when I was a young adult coordinator in Chicago, when I worked at the Museum of Science, I mean, all of these things were coming together and when I was asked to consider serving as the Librarian of Congress, that also cinched the deal because mm -hmm. it was to serve. Yeah. And how could I work to make that library more accessible to everybody? You were at the Library of Chicago for a long time. Yes, and I started you, my career. Right, and you, you met a couple of important patrons while you were there. Well, there were people there. The Obamas. That, uh, in fact, before uh, 
uh, Mrs. Obama was married, uh, mm -hmm. she worked for the then mayor uh, daily, and one of her uh, portfolio parts was the library, and that's how I got to meet her in first. And so their commitment to literacy is very strong. I mean, nominated by President Obama, sworn in as the 14th librarian of Congress in September of 2016 yes. by Chief Justice John Robert. Pretty heady times for a kid from Chicago. I'm telling you, and for a librarian, because right. I'm the first librarian in 70 years. And so that was very rewarding for me professionally. And I'm sitting here <laughs> clutching my cup uh, from the West Virginia Library Commission because it has two Library of Congress programs, uh, Letters About liter Literature mm -hmm. and the Center for the Book. And so it really warms my heart. Two of our most important programs. That the Library of Congress programs are reaching out to libraries throughout the country. What are the key issues that you deal with every day? I know you've, you've been a public librarian and now you're the nation's top her. librarian. What are the everyday issues that you have to deal with? The everyday issues are very similar, just sometimes a different scale as the ones that libraries throughout the country and even the world are facing. The impact of technology, keeping up with technology, making sure that we provide the resources in a timely manner, uh, we have budget constraints and concerns, uh, we are looking at our workforce and retraining and also recruiting in younger uh, staff members. So some of the same issues are also mirrored right at the Library of Congress. One of the most interesting things that I've kind of found out in, in researching the Library of Congress is that a lot of people don't realize it's a library. Right. And so how do you, I mean, how do you explain to folks, hey, we're a library just like your public library down the street? We're the largest reference library in the world. The only people who can actually physically check out materials mm -hmm. are members of Congress, but also other libraries. And so we lend materials to other libraries. We also have collections that we're digitizing that'll be at everyone's fingertips. And we have programs like Letters About Literature, uh, Center for the Book. We do so many things. And what we want to do now, and this is what really attracted me to uh, the position, is to let people know about it. We've been called one of the best kept secrets mm. in the country. We don't want to be. Mm -hmm. And we want to get the word out about what the Library of Congress can do for local libraries. How does the average citizen access your collection? The easiest way from anywhere is through the website, LOC, Library of Congress mm -hmm. gov. And people can get into the digitized collections. They can download photographs. We have an extensive uh, prints and photographs uh, archive. They can chat with curators and librarians. They can really explore all of the resources right there online. What is your vision? And, you know, as you look at this job, and you've been on the job, what, a year and a half now? A year and a point. half. Uh, what is your vision? for the Library of Congress as, as you go forward? My vision is actually part of the legacy of my predecessors to enhance and expand the use of the unique collections. The collections of 23 presidents from George Washington to Coolidge, the world's largest collection of comic books and baseball memorabilia. I'm really interested in the baseball memorabilia. I know, we have an exhibit in, <laughs> right for the All-Star Game in July. So that Part of me picking up the baton uh, from my predecessors is to not only preserve these collections, and, but to make them more readily available. And so you'll see traveling exhibits, you're going to see a lot of things, and we'll be getting the word out even more. I guess in the modernization of libraries, which is an ongoing thing at the local level, and I, I assume would be at, right. at, at your level as well. One of the biggest challenges is modernizing when you have special and unique items, uh, you have to take care of them, preserve them, and then digitizing them requires, as you know, it's not just making a copy. 
and things like that. So, but we're really excited about it too. So I, I know you mentioned actually no buts about it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you mentioned the comic books and the value of some of these comic books oh and to put goodness. them on display is pretty amazing. Uh, and so, so I guess those comics are you digitizing those kinds of things as well? No, what, that would be hard to do. What the library is, the Library of Congress is focusing on in digitizing is the unique collections that we have. The letters of Alexander Hamilton to his wife, the diary of Teddy Roosevelt, all of the unique things that no other library has, those are the things that we'll be digitizing. Mm -hmm. And we'll be sharing their other resources, the other books and things like that with libraries, but it's those unique items, that's what we're gonna put up. Now, you were president of the American Library Associ Association in 2003? 2003, 2004. 2004. Uh, you were a pretty vocal opponent of the Patriot Act at that time, and, and privacy issues were uh, at the forefront of, of what you were talking about at that time. What Do you still feel as strongly well, about this? Well, actually, at the time, it was a very tense time, as mm -hmm. you could imagine, yes. and I think a lot of people remember. And there was one section in the Patriot Act, Section 215, that talked about records. And the library association that I represented at that time was very concerned about making sure there was a balance between security and personal rights to know and to look. And so as of today, the library community is represented by the American Library Association is very pleased with the revisions that have been made to the Patriot Act to protect personal privacy as we protect our country. And so we think that our push at that time uh, really bore fruit. Well, that stance, I believe, uh, uh, made you, uh, got your name 2003 Woman of the Year by Ms. Magazine. That was something. Yeah, that's... The same year as Selma Hayek, <laughs> I'm telling you. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty okay for a librarian. <laughs> You know, a Library of Congress is, uh, I, I believe, the oldest federal institution. Yes, we like to say the first. The first, the first federal institution. I really think that shows the Founding Fathers placed a lot of importance yes. on libraries. Uh, do you feel the libraries, not just Library of Congress, but public libraries, are still relevant and still oh. important? Oh, my goodness. And all I had to do is go home to Baltimore that I do every night. And I know that libraries are really, in most communities, opportunity centers. They're the places that people not only can get online to get jobs, but they have literacy programs, they have programs for teens. All of these things make libraries vital in communities. You can get your flu shot at a library. <laughs> what do you think the future holds for public libraries? Public libraries are now also viewed by the public as those places to get help, to have sanctuary, and to help them live their best lives. And so public libraries are places in communities. And in some communities, they're the only place that people can come together, that they can get that kind of help. And so the future is bright. We all have challenges. Technology is keeping us on our toes. However, I think the appreciation for what libraries do is, is still strong. When you look back on your career, what would you like your legacy to be? Oh my goodness. That is something that's very daunting because I still think I'm working on things. <laughs> what I hope that people will think about is that I believed in the power of libraries and what they can do for people and community. Dr. Hayden, we appreciate you taking the oh, time with us today. thank you. And I mean, I have really enjoyed my time in West Virginia, and I'm going to be back for the book festival. <laughs> we'll be back with more on Libraries Today after this. As I mentioned, the Library of Congress is the largest library in the world with a huge staff and a huge collection and it provides Americans with a wonderful national library. But libraries don't have to be huge to be successful. Sometimes a successful library comes in a small package. Let's visit with a couple of librarians who have made their relatively small libraries 
an important part of their community. With me now is the director of the Burnsville Public Library in Braxton County, Beth Anderson. Beth, thanks for being with us. No problem. We're glad to be here. We have just been talking about the world's largest library, Library of Congress. Yes. Uh, I thought we would shift gears and talk about a library that's a little smaller than that oh, yeah. <laughs> in Burnsville. Uh, so tell me about it when you, you try to do programs that the big libraries, bigger libraries do. Right. Uh, how do you approach that? Um, actually, we um, tailor, of course, to meet our needs. But also, we're just in our second sessions of the Family Creative Learning program with in cooperation with West Virginia Public Broadcasting. It teaches coding for five to eight year olds in their family. Uh -huh. um, they want you to commit to ten families, so we just had to split it in half right. to meet the needs because our library is so small, ten families would be wall-to-wall -wall people. Right. So we just split it and we're do we did two sessions. So mm -hmm. that's one way. Um, another way is, you know, we tweak and turn the screws and you know just dial in on um, bigger programs. I'm very excited because I attended the PLA conference a couple weeks ago and there's so many ideas I'm wanting to implement. So well, tell me about some of the programs you have already implemented. Okay, um, we did we do um, after school programming four nights a week. Um, mm -hmm. Monday is our Lego club. Tuesday is our movie night. Wednesday is Aaron's book club. It was started by a 10 year old fourth grade student who didn't really like to read but sat in on an adult book discussion group that we had and said hey why aren't there any groups like this for kids my age mm -hmm. so we started one for him and um, they read Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim and we had from first grade to sixth grade that participated and they read it popcorn reading and when we started, the first grader didn't read at all. And when we finished, the first grader was reading a couple of paragraphs at a time. So it was That's really great. interesting to see that. And then Thursday is what we call hands-on reading, which is our STEAM program. Well, Beth, tell me about last year's Eclipse viewing program. I know oh, you, yeah. you had a program around that. Yeah, um, we were actually, the, the wonderful programming was actually able to happen because we received the Inclusive Intern Initiative from PLA. Um, we were part of the inaugural group of that. We were the smallest library to participate. Um, and it allowed us to hire two teenage interns. And one of the programs that they did was Eclipse programming. We did a whole series of programs for children and adults um, based on the Eclipse program. Um, we had a science teacher come in to one of our ch uh, summer reading programs and talk about the Eclipse and did different things with them, the kids. Um, we had the telescope director, the head of telescope operations from Green Bank Observatory. He came and did a children's program and an adult program. We brought in the mobile planetarium and we had it at the Burnsville Elementary School and every class got to go in and watch and then we ha opened it to the public for after the school, after school went out. Um, then we did um, Eclipse Education and we had a live viewing at the library and we had over, we had between 40 and 50 people on the front lawn of the library for the viewing which is huge for us. So and That's a great program and I think it really illustrates how a small library can make a big impact yes. on their community. Yeah, we, we received um, the Starnet grant that gave us 200 um, telescope, not telescope, but 200 viewing glasses for the, for the eclipse and we were able to purchase 20 additional sets um, and we were able to provide all of the staff, students, and faculty at Burnsville Elementary glasses. And they came, they were able to come out and view the eclipse because we had provided them with the glasses. So that's great. That is, that is, you were also uh, awarded a national scholarship for small rural libraries. Yeah, um, for Ripple, it's going to be um, in July down in Atlanta for strategic planning and a database strategic planning. I'm very excited because we don't have a strategic plan right now. <laughs> and so this is gonna help. And I'm hoping to be able to help the town that we're in and possibly the county as well. 
I mean, looking at all the things you do, it's a very impressive list, by the way. Thank you. Uh, as you put these things together, uh, what kind of advice do you have for other small libraries? It, we have 171 libraries in the state right. of West Virginia, and a good chunk of those are small rural libraries yes. like yours. Yeah. What, what's the advice that you would give those libraries? Um, my philosophy is your library is only as strong as your programs. Um, because the programs are what is going to get people in the door and then they're going to come back when they see what all the library has to offer. Mm -hmm. So keep plugging. If a program doesn't work, change the day, change the time. Um, try to work with it. See if Don't just write it off the first time. Give it a couple of times and then try to tweak it. Just keep working at it. What's your biggest challenge? Probably lack of staff. Um, we have 1.03 employees, so um, I work 30 hours. I work 30 hours a week, um, and my assistant, the library assistant, works 11. So um, it's very difficult to try to do programming, um, but I just, you know, um, it's a challenge. But it's one that we've met, and we're doing great things for our community, and that's what it's all about. I think you have to be able to think pretty quickly on your feet, make adjustments when yes. you need to. Yeah, um, an example of that, we did a family movie night at Christmas time with the Grinch that stole Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, everybody was going to come in their pajamas and we were going to, the assistant and I were going to each run a table for a craft and I got a text that morning that she had forgotten that her family Christmas was that day and she was going to be unable to attend. So my family came and helped me set up and then my husband dressed up like the Grinch, my son <laughs> took pictures, and I ran two tables with two different crafts at the same time. Um, it turned out we had 18 people attend the program, and the kids got to take pictures with the Grinch, and the Grinch actually stayed the entire time. I think my husband lost five pounds <laughs> because of the costume, but um, they loved it. They had a great time, and you know we had so many kids show up in I was worried because I came in my pajamas and my boys came in their pajamas, but I was worried other people wouldn't participate in that part. And I think there was only one family that came that didn't have pajamas on. <laughs> so it's not like we told them they couldn't do it, but it was, you know, if you want to come in your pajamas, you can. And 95% of them did. So that was good to see. Beth, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back after this. Share your heart, share your love. Make a shelter pet part of your world. We're talking about small libraries in West Virginia. And with me now is the director of one of those small libraries, the Pine Grove Public Library in Wessel County, Donna Goons. Donna, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Well, it's always a challenge for small libraries to try to come up with the programs of the larger libraries managed to put out. How do you deal with that? It's hard to deal with because getting the parents to bring their kids into the library at a regular time to, you know, you know, we'll have a few come in and then maybe later we'll get more in. It's just getting the parents to get the kids into the library to have the programs. And we're, that's what we're doing. we got a new person in working now, and she's trying to get more kids into the library. So just getting the programs going and getting more people into the library. What are the kind of programs you focus on? Um, summer reading, um, story hour is our main thing right now. We're trying to get some um, chess games, card games in, get more people into the library. You get them in there, get, get them a library card, get them check out books, just to get them in there to you know, check things out. Right. How do you choose the programs you end up putting out for your patrons? Well, we put out a, um, on our Facebook and see what kind of input we get back. Mm -hmm. you know, if we get a good input, then we go forward with it. If not, we kind of you know, back off on it and, and see what the public wants. And we ask the public, what do you want? How do, you, how do you ask the community about your programs? Is there a, a specific way you go about that? Facebook. Facebook? Yeah. Yep. Everybody yeah. there is in Facebook, so that's the, the big thing of getting people in. 
getting response is Facebook. That's a big change from libraries from probably 15 years ago, right? Yeah. 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 What other changes have you seen at the small library level? I mentioned Facebook. What other kinds of things are you seeing? Um, people more using the computers for uh, job interviews. Um, a lot of, um, we got a gas wells, a lot of gas wells there. So faxing is, is real big. So it's just, just hard for small libraries. I know a lot of times it seems to me that the smaller the library, sometimes the more connected they are to the community. Yeah. Do you find that to be the case in Pine Yeah, Bay? Yeah, we're, we're small, but you know, the, we, get, we get a lot of help from the, compu the community. And you know, just people, you know, mouth to mouth saying, okay, come to the library. You know, mm -hmm. we have that and we get more people in like that too. You know, things are changing with people staying at home and getting on the internet at home and that kind of thing. Is that impacting the number of patrons that come through your door? Do you see more people because you have the internet? Do you see fewer? What's... Yeah, we, we have more or less, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when the um, um, books, e-books came out. Mm -hmm. You could see the people that used to come into libraries and get books, now they get on e-books. So you see less of them. Does that mean you have to shift how you approach those kinds of people? Well, we don't see them a whole lot mm -hmm. because they're home reading now. They can get you know, their books mm -hmm. at home. So every once in a while we'll see them come in you know, because they can't get a book on, you know, their ebook or something. So we'll see them and, you know, just trying to get new releases in that they can't get. Or some of them will, you know, the older books are not on there, so they'll come in and get an old book. As the leader of a smaller rural library, what are the biggest challenges that you end up having to face? Just getting the community in, get them, you know, um, into the library. Mm -hmm. It is hard getting them into the library because they think they don't have to have a library anymore. Get on the computer. Yeah. So that's why we're trying to get different activities in, trying to get them in there. If you had to make yourself a wish list for the things that you would like to have, what would they be? A bigger place. Our library is one of the carousels. Mm -hmm. So it's a small library and we're running out of space. So a bigger place would be wish number one. Thanks, Don, I appreciate the time. Well, thanks for asking me. We'll be back with more on Libraries Today after this. Libraries come in all sizes. From the Library of Congress with its 5,000 member staff to large West Virginia libraries such as those in Kanawha and Cabell counties to the libraries that provide vital services to the small communities that dot the West Virginia countryside. Regardless of size, they all have important work to do and we're lucky to have them. I'd like to thank my guests for being on today's show. Burnsville Library Director Beth Anderson, Pine Grove Library Director Donna Goontz, and the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. I'm Stan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.